If there's one complaint that I've always heard about frames, it's that they're too expensive. Well, I got to spend some time with Chris LaRue from Armitan, and we addressed that specifically. Why are frames $100 or more at times? I think you'll enjoy his answer. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you today the one, the only, the man behind Armitan frames, Chris LaRue. How are you doing today, Chris? Very good. How are you, Michael? I'm doing all right. Now, you're coming to us from Thailand, right? Uh, yes, I, I reside in Thailand. Uh, the company is actually based in Taiwan. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, so the time difference between you and I is exactly 12 hours, which is That's correct. which always makes scheduling interesting. Um, so it's 9 a.m. here for me, and it's 9 p.m. there for Chris. So um, it's uh, it's definitely always fun to schedule international folks. Um, well, I'm happy uh, you're the one getting up early, not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, adulting is hard. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and kick it off. Um, let's talk about Armaton frames. And, <clears throat> you know, as a, uh, sometimes I like to get a feel for the business itself. So as a business, how many folks work for Armaton? Uh, it, it varies. Uh, basically, <laughs> uh, we're, a little, we're a little bit different than, say, a retail store. Sure. where a retail store will carry a bunch of different brands, a mm -hmm. bunch of different products. And, of course, uh, if it's managed well, they try to carry products that are that, that do well on the market. Mm -hmm. And if they do that consistently, they can keep up uh, the same number of employees, essentially. Whereas mm -hmm. we more depend on the releases of our, mm -hmm. uh, essentially, of our new models. Uh, so we vary between... Anywhere between about 14 uh, to 35, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how, how well things are going and depending on uh, the new releases that we have. Okay. Yeah. And the, probably the highest that we've had all at once would have been about, uh, I would say somewhere about seven or eight months after the release of the original Comedian, which mm -hmm. pretty much took, took the market by storm. Yep. Um, and uh, the next big, big, uh, well, I guess the, the following two big high points mm -hmm. in, in, in our level of stats would have been, again, after the release of the Rooster, mm -hmm. and then re more recently, the release of the um, uh, Marmot. Yeah, I, I definitely saw all of those making big waves. It seemed like there were... <clears throat> there were a lot of pilots that were flying them and loving them. Um, so it was, it was very interesting to see. Um, cause I, I, I think there's so many frames or there were at one point so many frame companies to choose from that to see such a huge market share means you must be doing something right. Um, so what do you, what do you think were the, the, the design principles that led to the success of those frames? I think was the implementation of uh, originally aluminum, mm -hmm. uh, basically because what it does is it allows, uh, well, at least that was the design principle that I was mm -hmm. basing my design decision at the time. It, it allows for, for creating provisions that you you can't really create with just flat carbon sheets. Mm -hmm. Flat carbon sheets, you can only drill them one way, you can't drill right. them the other way. Right. So you're limited in terms of design. Where if you uh, if you had um, aluminum parts, you you yeah you open uh, the doors there for mm -hmm. different design options. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I would say I would say that's probably one of the main reasons. Because, I mean, we did well prior to the Comedian back sure. when we were using only carbon fiber, mm -hmm. uh, but. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the Comedian is what really put us on the map, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, that's when we started ha hiring more people and seeing mm -hmm. uh, definitely a high, very steep uh, upward curve mm -hmm. in, in the demand for our product. What does your What does your release cycle look like? How long is it? Well, some people say it's not often enough. Some people mm -hmm. say it's too often. Too often. <clears throat> right. It's it's hard to uh, it's hard to hit it, you know, to get it right. You don't want to stagger releases, yeah. uh, but at the same time, uh, 
I mentioned, is just for example that, that, that um, you know when you when you start having to lay off staff because you're towards the tail end of the shelf life of a product, that's when uh, as the company owner, then I start getting antsy about releasing something new. But uh, yeah. I think it is something that you know. Essentially, if we wanted to avoid that altogether, we'd have to release models too often. So mm-hmm. it's roughly for a flagship about once a year. Okay. okay. Uh, so we I mean, released the Comedian on Christmas Day 2016, mm-hmm. just before the end of the year. Then we released a Comedian TI made of titanium mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. the same day the following year on Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I... I, I we were we could have been ready to do the same thing the following year, but what mm-hmm. we had faced the two years before that is that you release something on Christmas Day, and literally within the month or two from there, we get hit by the closure of China, Chinese New Year. Right. And this really affected our ability to not run out of stock, essentially. Right. So with the Marmot, I decided to wait until, uh, until China rebooted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the factories went back to full production to right. release it, and it actually did quite. It, it made it a lot easier. It made okay. it a lot easier. Um, um, so, one of the things that um, I know in the past, and I think maybe still today, is that there's been a lot of complaint about frames that are a hundred plus dollars. Even I've even seen complaints about folks that are releasing frames that are, you know, eighty, seventy five dollars. Um, but being an engineer myself, um, I know that a lot of times some of those costs are things like R and D. Um, so talk to me about like, what is the R and D for one of your frames like, and how expensive is that actual R and D? Um, it, 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 I think to, to answer that question, I need to go back a little sure. bit in time. Okay. Where, where basically, if you if we look at the Comedian, for example, mm-hmm. uh, we started off with a frame called the Fusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, fusion meant fusing metal mm-hmm. and carbon fiber together. Uh, this model was never released. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ended up moving in a completely different direction, mm-hmm. which ended up being the Comedian. Mm-hmm. And between these two projects together, like we're looking at a year and a half. Uh, producing parts, testing, assembling, testing, and most times uh, reproducing a second round of prototypes Mm -hmm. uh, and then improving things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mainly, this mainly comes from when you get the product and and you start assembling it. And not necessarily just assembling the frame, Mm -hmm. but actually building it and putting the components on it. Right. You You run into... It's when you run into things and it makes you think like, well, maybe we could definitely improve this. We could definitely improve that. And then from there, we go back to the drawing board, make some changes. Mm-hmm. So it really took a long time for the first iteration of the community online. Um, and from there, if we're looking at uh, other similar frames that use aluminum, mm-hmm. like, for example, we just released a tadpole recently. Yeah, uh, that was much faster. Okay, uh, because we, uh, for one, we have good relationship with a metal factory. This was part of the struggle originally. Mm-hmm. We went through a number of different places and had them cut. Uh, I wouldn't send them the final designs in on purpose. Mm-hmm. I would send them somewhat similar designs right. to see what they could do and how it would turn out, and it just wasn't good. Mm-hmm. And um, I think almost by luck. By luck, at some point, I ended up in touch with one place. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've, be, we've now been working with them for several years. Okay. And the price, their prices were better. Their lead time were better. And the mm-hmm. quality didn't compare. Okay. And so, if you take that into consideration there, uh, the fact that by now we have that, uh, that foot in the right place, essentially, to make mm-hmm. the parts, uh, mm-hmm. that helps us. But then again, uh, once we departed from aluminum to go to titanium, right? Uh, we face a similar problem where sure. lead time is longer for titanium. It's a lot more difficult to process. Mm-hmm. And we were sort of delving in the unknown. We weren't sure if it would work or not. 
we weren't sure if uh, as opposed to bending it would be too brittle for example mm-hmm. so it was a bit of a gamble releasing the rooster mm-hmm. because let's say that um, if it turned out that people hit a pole with it and that the, the cage the titanium cage just crumbled or I, you just say it would fracture too easily mm-hmm. uh, on a warranty per on a warranty reason it would have been quite a disaster mm-hmm. uh, and we did well in the end. Uh, not many people broke the titanium on a rooster. Okay. Uh, actually, really not many people. Okay. That was a little bit overkill, I think. <laughs> but uh, right. But we, you know, we had to try. And then following that, we moved on to the marmot, mm-hmm. uh, which once again, now we had a little bit more experience, a little bit better idea of what this material was able to withstand. Mm-hmm. And as such, the R and D process uh, was, uh, you know, I would say, a little bit easier, a little bit shorter. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to address your point there, where you mentioned, you know, people are unhappy about uh, paying a hundred dollar for a frame, and I, I can mm-hmm. totally see where that comes from, mm-hmm. uh, because there's so many offerings these days from China that are like, right, you know, and and I mean, I, I'll be honest, some of them are actually decent frames too, like mm-hmm. they're not can't say oh it's made in china it's no good uh, mm-hmm. it's not true i think if you go back a couple of years ago i think that yeah a lot of it would could probably say that in a lot of cases but i think that uh by now there's companies in china that uh they've really picked up their act mm-hmm. and they've got good designers on board uh they sort of some of them started with cloning and now they're doing all original stuff mm-hmm and some of them actually started with original stuff from the get-go. Mm-hmm. And their frames are good quality. And um, they're, they're, they're really inexpensive compared to, say, what we do yeah. or other Western companies do. Sure. And so we get a lot of criticism for this. Uh, but I think that it, it's, it's, it can be a little bit frustrating because when you start talking about this, like uh, especially in a written format on Facebook, Mm-hmm. Right, things get lost in translation a bit, and it's also kind of hard to 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 make a make things very clear essentially <clears throat> without just plain giving numbers to people of what things cost. Uh, but now, put plainly, uh, if you if you hire um, a factory in China to produce parts for you, uh, there's what's called the Western tax. Mm-hmm. And now this is something that all Western companies have to deal with, um, and there's just no way out of it. I mean, you can right. negotiate with right. this company as best as you can, but it really seems like they have sort of a, a, a certain margins in mind that they're willing to achieve for Western companies, and mm-hmm. it's just not the same that they will do for a local company. Mm-hmm. And for us... It's another part that's a little bit frustrating for us is that we are essentially often compared to other companies. I won't name them now, but right. uh, companies who do really well in the market who are Western companies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we offer a warranty and they don't. Right. So when it comes to a pricing structure, we, we simply can't, uh, in, in a way, be compared to these companies because right. we charge the, the same or less. Mm-hmm. For a frame that has a lifetime warranty, and then of course we can't, uh, we can't possibly be compared to uh, companies that operate out of China. Yeah, I, I'm actually I don't really have much of a problem mentioning numbers here. For something like uh, the original Comedian, we sold it for ninety five dollars. Yep. Uh, main plate costs us about twenty four dollars to cut. Mm-hmm. This includes the material, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, and the total price for the entire thing it might cost. Now that's mm-hmm. before PayPal fees, uh, that's before shipping fees, that's before labor, that's before R and D. Mm-hmm. Was fifty two dollars on that frame. That's okay. my cost. Meanwhile, yeah. the clone sells for twenty five dollars. Right. And right there, you, you you can imagine that's that's what you're looking at. There is that Western tax. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they're able to produce it for twenty five dollars. Mm-hmm. But my cost is more than double at fifty-two dollars. How can we compete with them? It's it's impossible, right. yeah. Right. So it puts a lot of pressure on us to make sure that our designs are good, that they appeal to people. And you know, given the, the 
you know, if you look at this, you pay $52 to produce a frame. And if someone breaks their main plate two times, you're actually you, in the you're, black. You're pit. losing money. Yeah. You're losing money. And yeah. some guys will break it eight times, mm -hmm. nine times. Mm. But thankfully, a lot of people don't. Yeah. Or some people just don't use the warranty. Yeah. Uh, so in the, in the end, we do okay. But uh, yeah. When it comes to the criticism about the high prices of our frames, I'm, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate, but this is really not something that, uh, you know, we, we can listen to end users as much as we can, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we need to be able to pay the bills, we need to be able to pay the staff, and yeah. to me, it's also very important that we need to be able to keep up with having that, you know, that golden standard of lifetime warranty, which mm -hmm. has been a big part of what how we've been recognizing the industry today. So I want to keep up with that. So um, speaking of the lifetime warranty, um, you know, one of the, the company that I first started flying, Nito Frames, um, I had a conversation with Justin Skinner and uh, they tried to go the lifetime warranty route and um, it ended up being a factor in them having to close down because the warranty claims were superseding the actual frame sales um, i know i actually watched that video of yours okay yeah yeah so and, i'm uh, familiar with that conversation yeah and uh you know i mean it's unfortunate and i think uh, offering a lifetime warranty is a huge risk um and i'm sure you i'm sure you're aware of that um but yeah. at the same time um it, it also like if if you do break your main plate eight times um and you know that you can get a new one every time. Like you've you've well exceeded the 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 cost that that would have cost you to repurchase that eight times. So, um, yeah, it's uh, good on you. Um, I mean, it's uh, you know with the lifetime warranty, the, the main risk it, it is a risk. Yeah, and the risk is that we really depend essentially on keeping business up. Mm -hmm. And that means that every single flagship release that we release, it, mm -hmm. there, there's no option. It can't flop. Right. It can't flop. I mean, we spent a certain amount of time and a certain amount of funds creating these designs. Mm -hmm. And if we were to release it, no one wants to buy it. You're well, done. then we still have these warranty coming in. Meanwhile, we don't have a, that continued revenue to mm -hmm. be able to keep up uh, with that kind of support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's... Uh, Yes, I think that the warranty, and mainly because it's lifetime warranty, mm -hmm. if we had a one-year or two-year warranty on the frames, sure. eventually that's it. You, you're not warrantying old frames anymore. Right? Right. It's kind of it's in the past. Mm -hmm. Whereas for us, we're still warrantying frames now that we released five years ago. Mm. Uh, that's just you know, I mean, yeah. of course, as they become older, they a lot of them end up on the shelf. They're not used anymore, mm -hmm. so the warranty mm -hmm. claims are few were and further apart sure but, and if we go back all the way to the original committee on in 2016 now uh every single releases that we've had since then we have ongoing warranties still to this day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. just just how it goes we actually we actually warranty the frame for the first time in quite some time now about a few weeks ago it was a, <laughs> called the morphite v2 uh-huh and, and that's a, like a five-year-old frame there right this guy contacted us, and I remember our, our support guy actually went into a Slack channel and said, "Check this out." He didn't even know that frame existed. He's like, "This guy wants warranty. Like, what is this thing? Because it's not listed on the website anymore either, right?" Right. Yeah. So we had to tell him, "Say, yeah, yeah, we still have the parts for this." Yeah. And we actually keep them for that purpose. Yeah. Right. We keep number right. of parts on hand, yeah. so that if someone breaks it, we'll have it. We can. We don't yeah. have to make them wait for us to produce it or something like yeah. that uh, that's yeah. that's yeah that's crazy yeah. um what's the um what's the what's the most popular armaton frame right now i would say the, well if we look at numbers just yeah. numbers are only just units, it would yeah. be the it would be the marmot okay definitely the marmot we did have some problems with the uh, carbon fiber Okay. that we initially used for this model. And I think that it did us a disservice to a, a, a definite extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, it's uh, it's still doing very, very well, this model. Mm -hmm. I think uh, for based on the design attributes, 
mm-hmm. uh, and the feedback from people who use it. Mm-hmm. You know, because we did have poor feedback about the carbon fiber that we used originally uh, based on production issues that we had. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have addressed these issues. We've uh, came up with solutions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, essentially that's the only complaints we've ever had about the model was the, 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 the carbon fiber we used initially. Mm-hmm. And having solved that by now, we're sort of over that lump of negative negative feedback that we had over it. Sure. And uh, we haven't had any complaints about anything else regarding that model in terms of design, uh, what it's able to do for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's mainly very versatile because the camera angle at the front can be set up to, you know, for guys to do slow chases, things sure. like that, Zero, yeah. where it can go to a very low tilt mm-hmm. on the camera. And then if guys want to do like, uh, you know, Maddie hardcore stunts. Athletics, yeah, yeah. Maddie st- and go with really steep angle, then you can do that as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's warranted, which yeah. has its appeal. Yeah. Um, a final question here, you know, going into the, the, the idea of carbon, um, it sounds like there is some kind of different, the, I guess all carbon is not made the same. All carbon fiber is not made the same. How do you, how do you know? Cause it, you know, with the, it sounds like the production problems with, uh, or the, the warranty problems with the Marmot, um, how do you know going into it that you've got good carbon versus something else? Well, we, uh, we've tried a whole bunch of different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one thing that, uh, uh, yeah, we having, because we don't contract the, the machinists. We only, we only purchase the carbon fiber. Sure. And by, and, and from there we're able to try a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, mm-hmm. We've tried uh, what's called the quasi isotropic, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, tried different grades, and I say grades. I mean, frankly, it's hard to say because when you look at it, it may look the same. But right. we tried different grades of carbon fiber. Uh, grade has a price, right? Right. There's a price range as well. You can go with some stuff that's mm-hmm. uh, cheaper. That's mm-hmm. mainly made in China. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And in terms of, in terms of um, how do we know it's good? There's essentially two ways. One is the feedback from testers mm-hmm. who crash them, who use them, and of course the real test is once they end up in the hands of the masses. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're able to uh, look at warranty numbers and say, well, how are we doing with this product? Mm-hmm. Hence, for example, why we ended up abandoning the quasi isotropic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was really cool. It was really trendy, but at the end of the day, uh, for this type of application, it's just not as strong as yeah. uh, as uh, as uh, unidirectional carbon right. fiber meant to to have the strength in, in the arms, mm-hmm. for example, right? Mm-hmm. And the other way is that we do stress tests, mm-hmm. which are very basic. Now we don't we don't have any. Um, uh, presses with gauges or anything like that we basically sure. use a, a scale on a hook mm-hmm. where we'll pull the pull on the parts and look at how, ma- how many pounds of pressure it'll take before right. it fractures okay. and then also we look at the weight fractures as well so what we what we want to have is a is a carbon fiber that breaks clean mm-hmm. if you have a fi- carbon fiber that once it's under a lot of stress it starts delaminating the wrong way right yeah then you know that the uh, it's, it's not as good, right? Mm-hmm. It'll tend mm-hmm. to cause more problems for pilots. Mm-hmm. Carbon yeah. splinters. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, to this day, there are people who say, "Yeah, the, the, the what we call the space grade carbon fiber we use on the Marmot is not good." And I'll tell you, Michael, it's it's really, really unfortunate because mm-hmm. it it simply isn't true. Yeah. The the carbon is vastly superior than anything we've used before. Uh, this is what the samples that we were working with were telling us. Mm-hmm. And this is what a number of pilots will tell you today. Mm-hmm. That they have never flown a, a frame that uh, that that was that would take so much abuse. Mm-hmm. But what happened is the companies you see we the company that we purchase it from, mm-hmm. uh, they're not actually the people who make it. 
Right. They purchase it from other companies who make prepreg carbon fiber uh, for the space aeronautic aeronautic industry and space industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what happens with prepreg is it's essentially pre-impregnated, mm-hmm. and it has to be cool, kept in a cool place, mm-hmm. and it has a shelf life. Uh, so essentially, if they make a certain number of this stuff, uh, and that it's still on their hands, and yeah. whether it's NASA or Boeing or whoever hasn't purchased it yet, you get the end of the batch. It, it, it's being thrown out, like yeah. uh, about ten million pounds. That's the big number now. About ten million pounds uh-huh. of this stuff is thrown out mm-hmm. annually in the U.S. alone. Wow! Right, because it, it expires essentially. Mm-hmm. The problem that we ran into is that the place that we contracted to finish the process, to turn the prepreg into flat sheets, mm-hmm. right? They were a very small company now, like three guys working for that company. Mm-hmm. They had to hire more staff. They had mm-hmm. to also purchase more equipment in order to meet uh, our contract, to be able to mm-hmm. meet our requirements. And they ran into issues, according to them now, and I think it may make good sense, uh, they ran into issues with heat, mm. and basically the heat when they were uh, curing the plates, mm-hmm. uh, heat was not exactly the same throughout the plates. Mm-hmm. So it, it's really problematic because what happens is that you can then cut, like say, fifteen plates out of that fifteen mm-hmm. main plates, uh, carbon main plate for a drone out of that one sheet, right? Mm-hmm. And three of them will be like. The bomb, like they're mm-hmm. they're solid, they're they're excellent, mm-hmm. and another two or three where heat was a bit less mm-hmm. will break too easy. Okay, and that's and it's problematic as well because uh, you know once the product ends up in our hands and it's been deburred and cleaned up, mm-hmm. they all look good. They yeah. really all look good. So yeah. fail, we couldn't possibly stress test each and every one of them. Yeah, right. So it explains why there's been a very, very big discrepancy in the feedback as to uh, was this good carbon fiber, was it bad, why is it mm-hmm. that some guys absolutely love it and others mm-hmm. absolutely loathe it, and that, that's what it comes down to. Like it's, sure. And uh, the person cutting it for us in the U.S., actually in Canada, mm-hmm. eventually uh, alerted me and said, Chris, there's something wrong with the sheets now, and I, he said, I've had this problem throughout production, but it's getting worse. Then he sent me some pictures, and he said, "Look, yeah. these plates have all cut. I've been cut uh, on the same sheets, but you can clearly tell the amount of deburring needed right. on some main plates versus the other, mm-hmm. showing that there was something with the manufacturing process mm-hmm. in terms of uh, making the sheets that was not right." Mm-hmm. It, uh, and you know, I think it's uh, I think it's largely solved now. Mm-hmm. And we still make we still make this carbon fiber. We still purchase this carbon fiber, but of course, the volume uh, at which we purchase purchase it is a mm-hmm. lot less. And of course, the people making it are well aware we've had these problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're well aware that these problems cost us mm-hmm. a lot of l- losing a lot of business. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that at the moment, the plates that we actually replace for warranty. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we're not selling it anymore is what it comes down to. Right. So yeah. my decision was, you know, I can't sell a product to a customer and then number of months down the line saying, sorry, if you break it, uh, we're just going to give you a different carbon. Right. So we keep making it, we keep it in stock. Uh, while we don't sell it, if, for example, you purchased one and you say, no, man, I, I love this carbon. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go back to the classic carbon. Mm-hmm. Then you you can warranty your frame and get the same product you purchased. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, yeah, in the in the last five, six, seven months or so, five months, uh, the 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 problems they had with heat, uh, mm-hmm. they've largely so- solved it. Mm-hmm. And a big part of this is they've got so much heating equipment now because <laughs> they were running and for much right. smaller orders, yeah. So they're yeah. able to really keep things hot and do much better with that. First off, can we just stop and appreciate how Chris says chameleon? Because I feel like an uncultured Neanderthal when I hear him say that word. I can't, I'm not even gonna try 
to mimic it. It's just so good. I can understand why he named the frame that way. If I could say that word that way, I would name that frame that. Anyways, Chris makes a lot of good points. Um, with a lifetime warranty, with the cost of the, the, the carbon and everything else that they offer in their frames, the, the frames are not cheap to make and therefore that, tra that translates to a higher cost for the customer. For better or worse, if you like it, you can get them. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. Um, but Chris makes a very strong point. In our next episode, Chris and I talk about the origins of Armitan. And specifically, maybe you didn't know this, but Armitan's first quad frame used aluminum arms. What do you think about that? Anyways, uh, as always, I would like to thank my patrons. Um, you guys are great. And I just want to let you know that if you are a patron, then you get a podcast version of in all these episodes in one go as soon as the launch date comes. Um, it is something you can plug into a podcast player and it notifies you immediately as soon as it goes up. Occasionally I get them out early. If you're looking for a podcast version, then the Patreon page that I have set up will get that for you. Um, in addition, I'm talking about adding some more perks to my patron. Um, things like maybe a Facebook group, we'll see. Um, but if you're interested, links in the description below, as well as links to all of um, Armitan's information. Uh, I hope you all have a great and fantabulous day, and I will talk to you soon.